Hello, everyone. My name is Evelyn Lindner, and I send you a very warm greeting. I would like to welcome you to this presentation of my thoughts on narratives and times of radical transformation. I was inspired by several conferences to which I was invited in the past months, all of which asked for new future-oriented meta-narratives. We human beings, we need narratives. Narratives that anchor us in the world, that tell us where we come from and where we are going, that provide us with long-term explanations about life's meanings and what our true significance is. Religions, family legends, and clan and national myths, they all provide such all-encompassing meta-narratives. Narratives that are so important that people are willing to die for them. We live in times now where there is a dire need for a new meta-narrative, one that for our entire shared living Earth community, rather than just for one group. A meta-narrative that is credible, convincing and inclusive, a narrative that explains why humanity stands at the abyss, a narrative that points at what we can do. Throughout the past millennia, since the Neolithic Revolution, one narrative has become increasingly salient, a narrative that indeed leads to the abyss, namely the human, that of human exceptionality and superiority. It is a narrative that says that we, the species Homo sapiens, have reason to be proud of our ability to be in control, to dominate, to win victories. Throughout the past centuries, and particularly the past decades, we have continuously increased competition for domination and control over people and planet, nations against nations, citizens against citizens, and all against nature. At the same time, we regarded dialogue mutuality and nurturing as secondary. I was trained in medicine and psychology and therefore I like to use the image of the body to illustrate my point. Since the Neolithic revolution, the so-called dominator model of society became prevalent all over the globe, a concept developed by social scientist Rihanna Eisler, where elites, usually men, were allowed to use the right arm, the sword arm, to devise strategies and give orders, to prepare for war if needed, representing the sympathetic system of the body that prepares for fight or flight. The left arm, the one that stands for maintenance and care, akin to the parasympathetic system of the body, was bound behind their back. Their subordinates, women and lowly men, suffered the inverse infliction. They were expected to exhaust themselves in service. None could use both arms, none could reach an inner balance, none could unfold their full potential. This is an injury that lasted for many millennia. I call it a war injury. Humanity suffered a millennia-long systemic war injury, and our forebears accepted it and they lived with it because preparedness for war had to be given priority in a world that was in the grip of what political scientists call security dilemma. This dilemma can be summed up with the motto of Roman thinker Vigetius. If you want peace, prepare for war. During the past 3% of human history, the past 12 millennia or so, humanity lived in the grip of this tragic dilemma. It permeated all of society with an acute sense of fear as background constant, fear of attack from outside, which indeed could happen anytime. By now, our biosphere, 
after having been treated by us humans as if it were just another enemy waiting to be conquered, is like a teacher who enlightens us that competition for domination is a suboptimal strategy at best, if not collectively suicidal. Negligence of maintenance and replenishment is a hideous killer. And also here, the human body can illustrate it. Heart attack is the outcome. It's the typical emergency troubleshooter disease. When nurturing is seen as negligible and victory as desirable, when the nurturing of relationships among ourselves and with nature is neglected, collapse is the result. This collapse is now with us globally. And it took us many millennia to manifest. We can call it sociocide and ecocide. The suffix side means killing. Words such as genocide, suicide, or pesticide, all end on side, stemming from Latin sida, the verb caedo, caede, caedes, caedere. That is what we do. We squeeze our planet to the last drop. Ecocide is the killing of our ecosphere, of our ecological world, of which we are only a small part, despite our belief to be its masters. We poison our planet, we drown it, and we burn it. Sociocide is the killing of our sociosphere, of the cohesion in our human communities, local and global. We live in a world now where hateful polarization poisons all our relationships. We have a pandemic of disconnection and loneliness, particularly in the Western world now, that will outlast the coronavirus pandemic. Britain had to appoint a special minister of loneliness in 2018. Not enough, the world is also armed to its teeth, nation against nation, citizens against citizens. So to the point that now, we risk dying of our war injury, of our misguided pride in domination that creates nothing but all out heart attack. Sociocide and ecocide together are the outcome of systemic humiliation, humiliation congealed into a system, just like South Africa was in the grip of humiliation congealed into a system called apartheid just like the world now is in the grip of global arms races by military corporate political systems. Ecocide and sociocide are driven by the same underlying catalyst, the very weapon of mass destruction that systems of humiliation use, namely cogitocide or cogitocide. This term was coined by the former head of the Club of Rome, Prince El Hassan bin Talal in 2020. Cogito or cogito or cogito comes from cogitare in Latin, to think. And cogitocide is the killing of our cogitosphere, the killing of the realm of thinking and reflection. It is the drowning of humanity in a sightless infosphere. I therefore fear that artificial intelligence may be a mis misnomer. In many cases, it may rather be artificial sightless sightlessness. It may simply be the digitalization of a kind of sightlessness that in former times was called fog of war, simply taking on a new shape and reaching new levels now. Big data, instead of becoming big success, may turn out as big disaster. 
all those sides, all those killings amplify each other. As a result, we risk now omnicide, the killing of everything, the inhalation of all life on earth. This is where we are now. We live in times of systemic decline where the old order is disintegrating as environmental and political disruptions amplify each other. We are at the end of a lavish party of exploitation for which our children, if they survive, will have to pay. Natural historian Sir David Attenborough said it in 2018. Right now, he said, we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years. I call it systemic madness waiting to be transformed into systemic sanity. Cultural historian Thomas Berry concurs, we cannot have healthy people on a sick planet. This is where we stand now. In this situation, what would a non-toxic meta-narrative for a transition towards a shared living Earth community be? Is it possible to forge one that unites all citizens of the world into one goal rather than pitting them against each other? Is, is it worth, worth making the effort? Can we go from more and me to we? Peace researcher Howard Richards faults postmodernist critics for leaving us with a cruel choice in this dire situation, I, uh, either no meta-narrative or a toxic meta-narrative. Richards fears that the discrediting of modernity has favored the rise of fundamentalisms around the world. My question to you, can we do better? This is the rural context in which I grew up. <laughs> this was when our planet was still blue and green. This was the place where my parents were displaced to after World War II. Coming from this rural background and from a family that is deeply traumatized by war and displacement, I have invested my entire life in exploring possibilities for viable meta-narratives. As a methodology, I have developed a very specific global life design where I invite everyone I meet to be my co-fellow researchers. I see it as my responsibility, my duty to use the privileges I have been offered in life together with the technological opportunities of our times to try to understand our world first, understand so I can suggest viable paths into the future. This is my life mission since childhood. Already as a child, I wanted to understand what we humans are capable of in terms of hatred and love, of violence and peace, of competition and cooperation, of foolishness and wisdom. Humanity's foundational questions always inspired me. How do people in different cultural realms conceptualize life and death and war and peace? How do they live love and hatred? Are we an antisocial or are we a pro-social animal? At the age of 20, I began with what I call living globally, being sedentary in the global village, immersing myself into different cultural realms all around the world, much more deeply than through mere travel. I do not travel. And uh, I have not yet met another person who lives like me, so I have made a longer explanation that you can download from the website, humiliationstudies.org. Since 45 years now, I live globally. I'm at home on all continents except Antarctica, and have collected experiences and insights that underpin my message with a substance that few, perhaps nobody, has been able to gather before. A substance that encompasses the entire globe. I live globally and locally at the same time, 
you know, deeply rooted in many local places, binding them together with love and tenderness into lived cosmopolitanism. Through living in the global village, I'm neither a Western nor non-Western person. I'm simply a global citizen in practice, not just in theory. I am a patriot of Earthland, including all its living beings. In my work, I use the ideal type approach of sociologist Max Weber, which allows for analysis and action to proceed at different levels of abstraction while acknowledging all the gray areas in between. Traffic can illustrate this. Each society has to decide on whether to go for left hand or right hand driving. This does not mean, however, that there is no diversity. Diversity can only reign for the vehicles and driving styles that people might want to use. Accidents are the result when these different levels of abstraction are confounded. These are my books and uh, you are warmly invited to uh, write to me and I send you review copies. My interest in the topics of dignity and humiliation emerged from my family background and my subsequent global experience. I see humiliation as an interpersonal act, an emotional state and a social mechanism. And therefore, it is relevant for a wide range of academic fields of inquiry, among them history, social psychology, social philosophy, political science, sociology, global studies, anthropology, neuroscience, and not least, psychology. Humiliation is relevant for all branches of psychology, clinical, health, developmental, cultural, community, social, and political psychology. Altogether, for any integral political psychological perspective whose theoretical lenses span all life-centered psychologies. The phenomenon of humiliation is everywhere, yet interestingly it had not been studied much on its own account before Linda Hartling, a relational psychologist with whom I work, and I began attending to it. And one reason may precisely be due to this need for trans, multi, and cross-disciplinary approaches. In my writing, I attempt to bridge academia's siloization by striving to understand the core messages of various fields of academic inquiry. Then I try to bring them together on different levels of abstraction using precisely the ideal type approach of a sociologist Max Weber. And finally, I attempt to reconstruct them from the perspective of dignity and humiliation. So far, I have done so with war, genocide and terrorism, international conflict, gender and security and economics, translated in Chinese, as you see, and in Portuguese. Now, I would like to explain to you how I see the promise entailed in our historical transition towards ideals of equal dignity, together with the dangers and pitfalls that need to be avoided. Our ancestors prior to the Neolithic revolution were few, and they lived in rather egalitarian small groups following the wild food that was abundant. The line in the middle that you see represents the line of equal worthiness. I respect you just as much as I respect myself. All members of the group are of equal worthiness. All can enjoy what I call pristine pride, pride that is not being humiliated. I use the infinitus symbol or Möbius strip, the horizontal lying eight that you see, when I think of unity in diversity, of dialogue in partnership, of solidarity in equal dignity. Then, when our species had completed 
what I call our first round of globalization around the time of the Neolithic revolution, a dramatic shift occurred in a rather brief historical time span. Abundant, expandable piles of resources turned into fixed ones. A win-win situation turned into a win-lose situation. Circumscription is a term used in anthropology and the security dilemma and also the commons dilemma became silent, salient. Our forebears responded with a new ethos and emotional coinage. The era of honor began, which legitimized the vertical ranking of human worth into higher and lesser beings. Presently, we are participating in yet another radical shift, as significant as 12,000 years ago. In the year 1948, with the adoption of the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights, Rights is its most prominent marker of this transition. And we have the aspiration to reach an ethos and emotional coinage of equal dignity in freedom and solidarity. At this point, we face an important problem. If we define freedom without solidarity, this will lead us back again. Let us look at the maxim of the French Revolution. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Liberty, equality and solidarity, cooperation and care. Then all three goals are lost if only lib liberty is aimed at. Sociocide and ecocide are the result when empowerment becomes narcissism. It's liberty overdone, so to speak. The self-esteem mov movement in Western societies may precisely have suffered such an overshoot of empowerment. Research suggests that it has created a social climate of solipsistic narcissism and characterized by chronic indignation and anger entrepreneurship all against all. Liberty, to truly manifest itself requires the generosity and dignified humility of solidarity, of responsible mutuality embedded in equal dignity. I have coined the word egalization to connote equal dignity that is free of humiliation, free of forced hierarchization, also free of forced equalization. If we imagine the human world as a container with a height and a width, then we can say that globalization addresses the horizontal dimension, the shrinking width, while egalization speaks to the vertical dimension, the degree of power differentials and inequality. Egalization is a process that moves away from a high container with superior masses at the top and inferior underlings at the bottom towards a flat container where all enjoy equal dignity as individuals free to engage in loving solidarity with each other and in mutually dignifying connection with all life on this planet. The horizontal line in the middle represents the line of equal dignity in shared humility. It illustrates a worldview that refuses to essentialize and rank secondary differences into primary differences at the core of human worthiness. In other words, it resists rankism. A passenger in a plane is equal in dignity with the pilots. The passenger's essence as human beings is untouched. The middle line in this figure does not signify that all human beings should be the same or have ever been the same or should become uniform or identical. Being forced into uniformity is the opposite of equality and dignity. Passengers in a plane can be very different. This is not a problem. Equal dignity can unite them all. What is a problem, however, is when rankists abuse the notion of equal dignity to undermine equality with the argument that inequality is nothing but freely chosen diversity. The middle line reminds us that the pilots 
are part of a highly functional hierarchy without which the plane would not fly. However, the plane has no difficulties flying without a first class and offering every passenger the same quality of care. Equalization invites ma masses to step down from arrogating superiority and it encar encourages inferiors to rise up from humiliating subordination, up from being held down, released from having lesser value and worth ascribed to them. Overlords are humbled and underlings elevated and all are entrusted with the co-creation of a new future of equality and dignity for all as responsible individuals in solidarity, in this way, nurturing true freedom and liberty. Today's global interconnectedness is a radical game changer, combined with the fact that this world is also finite. This represents the ultimate deterrent for traditional power over competition, be it power, power over others or over nature. This means that first order change is not enough now. Second order change is needed. Linear, transactional, partial, partial and quantitative change of behavior within an existing existing system is insufficient when causes call for qualitative discontinuous leaps from multidimensional and multi-level transformations of the system itself. While in former times only the tyrants were removed and tyranny was kept in place so that the formerly oppressed became the new oppressors, the dignified, a dignified future requires a level of peacemaking and bridge building that goes further. Former oppressors and former oppressed need to come together. Just as Nelson, Nelson Mandela strove to include all South Africans into their shared home country. The global ingathering of humanity, the shrinking of the world that brings us all together gives us the unprecedented opportunity to succeed with the second order change, to overcome hitherto unsolvable dilemmas and to dignify globalization. The dilemmas I'm speaking of are the security dilemma mentioned before, as you remember, if you want peace, prepare for war, and the global commons dilemma. Ecologist Garrett James Hardin explained that an unmanaged commons in a world of limited material wealth and unlimited desires inevitably ends in ruin. Indeed, ruin is now global. 12 million, after 12 millennia of humanity's campaign of depleting our planet's resources with ever increasing destructive efficiency, after having compounded the security dilemma with what I call growth dilemma that says, if you want material riches, invest in exploitation. Our primary task now, and this is my meta-narrative, is to finally unite as human family so we can leave behind all destructive dilemmas, promote global human security rather than military security, and realize what I call the blessings of the commons. In this situation, we are extremely fortunate that our grandparents have enshrined human rights ideals because these ideals offer pathways to survival on earth in dignity, pathways to unite as a human family of equally respecting and responsible members who face their life-threatening global challenges together. These ideals offer the compass needed in a situation where war means all out destruction rather than victory, where the dominator mindset has overstayed its viability, where competition for domination over people and nature is infeasible, practically, psychologically and ethically, where the only solution is global cooperation. The concept of dignity can bring together all religions, all faiths, and all life-giving ideologies of the world into one overarching meta-narrative. As long, however, as long, this is the condition, as long as the concept of dignity is defined as mutual solidarity, 
in the global village rather than as the autonomy of lone heroes competing for domination and control. Many can resonate with my definition of relig religion as love, humility, and awe for a universe too large for us to fathom. A culture of dignity can bring together traditional male and female role descriptions and merge the courageous heroism that formerly was reserved for males and the care work that was formerly delegated to women. The conceptually female approaches that maintain social cohesion through applying complex, relational, multilateral, foresighted, integrative, and holistic strategies. The concept of dignity can bring together everything. So that we, the global community, have everything now in our hands that is required to manifest what I call egalization, short for equal dignity for all in solidarity and freedom, and to dignify globalization so it becomes glob egalization, <laughs> my coinage, glob egalization. And when we add global cooperation, we can arrive at co glob egalization. And this is the shortest summary of the new meta narrative that I suggest. So this is the future. I hope for and I work for. This is my meta narrative. In a world that is interconnected, a world where human rights ideals have touched hearts and minds, the most significant obstacle to global cooperation is the sense of humiliation that arises from perceived dignity humiliation. Dignity violation. Let me explain. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulates that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. On my global path, I'm often astonished when I observe the tremendous strength of this promise, despite being undermined and violated so frequently and ruthlessly. The promise seems to be a genie that, once unleashed, cannot be put back into the bot bottle anymore. It has force now. It induces hope and has become a foundational value far beyond, beyond legal concepts. The reason for the strength of this promise, even in the face of the most callous betrayals, appears to be that it speaks, and this I observe everywhere on the globe, speaks to a deep human desire, the desire to rise up from being pushed down, the desire to stand upright, an embodied longing beyond language, beyond legal instruments. It is the simple and straightforward yearning to be respected as an equal fellow human being among fellow human beings. The strength of this yearning is also the reason for why breaking the promise of equal dignity humiliates so much more than when honor is infringed. It is the reason for why the violation of dignity carries the potential to lead to so much stronger reactions than the violation of honor. Not enough, the promise of equal dignity has also democratized the right to resist and given it to everyone. And more even, we also live in a world where technology is global now, so that a single lone hacker who feels humiliated can terrorize entire countries. Would-be Hitlers can establish global dictatorial mafia-like mafia structures with a hitherto unseen ease. All these factors together have the power to fill the world with hot cycles of humiliation.
So why is dignity humiliation so much more painful than honor humiliation? Let me explain. Honor humiliation can be characterized, ca categorized in four variants. A master can use conquest humiliation to subjugate former equal neighbors into a position of inferiority. When the hierarchy is in place, reinforcement humiliation keeps it in place, ranging from seating orders and bowing rules to brutal measure, measures such as customary beatings or even killings. Relegation humiliation is used to push an already low ranking underling even further down, while exclusion humiliation means excluding victims altogether, exiling or even killing them. This is the worst fate imaginable. What we see is that with the adoption of human rights ideals, all four types of honor humiliation turn into the last one, namely exclusion humiliation. All human rights violations immediately exile the victim from humanity. All acts of humiliation in human rights-based contexts, contexts have the psychological impact of excluding the victim from humanity. And since being evicted from human, hum, the human family altogether is the worst fate imaginable, this violation produces the most intense pain and suffering. It is a deeply hurtful experience to be deemed unworthy of being part of humanity. It assaults people at the core of their being. I call this type of humiliation human rights humiliation or dignity humiliation, or more precisely, it would be equal dignity humiliation. Ideally, in the situation, anger in response to dignity humiliation should give rise to what educator Paolo Freire called conscientization and be invested in trust building dialogue that fosters the partnership and mutuality model of society locally and globally. Yet the problem is that this may not happen. People who suffer dignity humiliation may revert to the retaliatory toolkit of honor humiliation, the toolkit of dual-like violence, which formerly was reserved to aristocrats. Instead of healing dignity humiliation through dialogue, they may cross back to the path of honor and unleash violent revenge. Instead of becoming a Mandela or Gandhi, they may choose the Hitler path, the path of terrorism. This is what we see today also. Human rights defenders need to be aware that the honor humiliation toolkit that was formerly reserved for aristocrats, the toolkit for revenge that grew out of honor humiliation is still more familiar to many people than the toolkit of dialogue. After all, ranked honor was the norm during the past millennia in most societies. It is therefore easier for populist demagogues to mobilize people, particularly men, by promising them more firearms for new victories than it is for a Gandhi or Mandela to mobilize people to engage in new arrangements of relationships. In my work, I therefore avoid using the term empowerment and replace it with entrustment. Entrustment suggests a larger obligation. It suggests that liberation movements and uprisings need careful limits that all should meet in the middle, between up and down, between the top and bottom of society and together shoulder the responsibility for creating a better world in mutually dignifying and joint humility. As feelings of humiliation hurt deeper than those that flow from honor humiliation, they entail the potential, therefore, to create the deepest of divisions. And this is why I describe dignity humiliation as the nuclear bomb of the emotions. Clashes of civilizations are harmless compared with clashes of humiliation. Clashes of humiliation can undermine our best chances for cooperation in a situation, as now, 
where mutual care and trust is needed more than ever. Dynamics of humiliation, I fear, will become the strongest obstacle to a dignified future. I very much value anthropologist William Urey's simplified depiction of history. Remember Max Weber's ideal type approach, where Urey pulls together elements from anthropology, game theory, and conflict studies. He describes three major types of society in chronological order, namely simple foragers, complex agriculturalists, and knowledge society. I use Yuri's historical periods as a frame to insert the historical and social development of pride, honor, and dignity as follows. I call the first 97% of human history prior to the Neolithic revolution, the era of pride, or more precisely, the era of, era of pristine, humble pride, pristine because it is not yet touched by systemic, systemic humiliation. It was the time when foraging and small scale gardening was prevalent, when there were still no limits for migration and the few people walking the planet still had enough space to freely follow the wild fruit. The past 3% of human history, the period of complex agri agriculturalism was the era of honor, or more precisely, the era of collectivistic ranked honor the era of systemic humiliation and arrogant pride. I dedicate my life to the third, to the future. Working to I work to return to dignified pride, a future of dignity. I work for an era of dignity or more accurately for a future of equality and dignity for all as individuals who are free to engage in loving solidarity with each other and in mutually dignifying connection with all life on planet Earth. This is the meta narrative I developed already in my first book in 2006. I suggested that there are four basic logics at the core of the human condition. Logics that cover the entire history of Homo sapiens over the past 300,000 years. Logics that draw on several academic disciplines and traditions and treat democracy, communism, capitalism, modernity, or postmodernity as epiphenomena. This table displaced these four logics, namely the pie of resources the security dilemma, the future time horizon, and social identity. The table also draws, shows how these logics manifest throughout the three major era, eras of human existence that I have defined as, as you remember, A, the era of pristine pride, B, the era of honor, ranked honor, and C, the era of equal dignity. The first logic addresses the question as to whether and to what extent the pie of resources is expandable. Here we have game theory as developed within the discipline of philosophy. The second logic concerns the security dilemma and whether it is weaker or stronger using international relations theory as developed in the field of political science. The third logic asks whether long-term or short-term future time horizons dominate, as described in many academic disciplines, among others, cross-cultural psycholo psychology in the indigenous seven-generation sustainability rule. The fourth logic concerns the human capacity to tighten or loosen fault lines of identification. Here we have social identity theory developed in social psychology. If we now inscribe these four logics into the chronology of human history on planet Earth that I presented above, from the era of pristine pride to the era of ranked honor, and finally to our hope today for an era of equal dignity and freedom and solidarity, then 
The worst scenario combines a short future time horizon in a context where the pie of resources is fixed or even diminished, where a strong security dilemma reigns, where solidarity is seen as being part of equal dignity in freedom, is not, <laughs> is not seen as being part of equality in dignity in freedom and individual and individuals and groups are exposed to humiliating treatment and retaliate with counter humiliation. Unfortunately, the world we live in now seems to veer into this malign direction. The most benign scenario, the one I work for, is a global knowledge society that treats knowledge as an expandable pie everyone has access, access to at the same time mindful of the finitude of the pie of ecological resources. A global knowledge society that invites everyone into one single global in-group where systems and practices of humiliation no longer have legitimacy. It is our fragile journey now towards a hoped for future where we transcend the security dilemma through global trust building in an atmosphere of, of respect for the div diversity of all in equal dignity, where we draw appropriate lessons from long past time horizons, indigenous peoples have them, for the sake of long future time horizons for us all to become the norm, for time horizons that reach even beyond seven generations, where we protect and replenish the planet as humanity's commons. Clearly, this narrative is highly simplified. It follows sociologist Max Weber's ideal type approach. The chronology of human history obviously is not as clear cut as described here. And we see expressions of all three eras concurrently in present day's work world. For instance, uncontacted, uncontacted tribes, A, live in the Amazonian rainforest in a national context where the dominator model, model of society is pres presently even resuscitated, B, it is entirely possible that humankind will travel backwards again in the future, that we will fail to continue our journey towards more dialogical partnership in the world, that the human rights revolution will join all other unfinished revolutions. Indeed, this seems to be the case at the moment in our world of worn down commons and full of humiliating experiences where grand author authoritarian narratives offer dangerous relief through denying facticity. Even though this is such a simplified model, I think it helps us to analyze social change over long time stretches and in different world regions, as well as aid future strategy planning. It offers us an overarching meta narrative for a dignified future into the digni for a dignified course into a future in times of deadly crisis in that it highlights the promise entailed in our historical transition towards ideals of equal dignity in solidarity and in forms of the dangers and pitfalls to be avoided. It offers the important warning that the destructive nature of the dynamics of humiliation becomes more salient the more the other parameters veer to the benign side. It warns that even the most benign scenario is vulnerable to turning malign when feelings of humiliation are allow allowed to grow, as their consequences can become so significant that they override and undermine otherwise benign trends. The model has many advantages, I think. It can relieve from despair and hatred because it opens space for compassion with our challenged species Homo sapiens. Throughout the past millennia, many among us were extremely proud of the human ability to dominate and control, unaware that this strategy was suboptimal at best and may bring us all down in the end. The model opens space for the human capability for love and courage to come to the fore in a situation where humanity is either 
as in hospital or already in hospice perhaps now. If we give it our all, if we hold hands in loving mutual support, we can co-create a future where the best sides, sides of human nature can flourish, courage and love in equal dignity. If it is too late and we are already in hospice, at least we can go down together in dignity. So what must we do? How can, can we regain our blue and green planet? Anthropologist Margaret Mead is often quoted as saying, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Together with Linda Hartling, you see her in the middle here, and a dedicated core group of scholars, educators, and practitioners, I have the honor of nurturing a global collaborative fellowship of people who wish to talk, walk the talk of dignity. And I do this work since the idea of it was born in 2001. Our Dignity Fellowship has around 1,000 invited members and around 8,000 people on our address list. You can look it up all on uh, humiliationstudies.org and meet the members of our Global Advisory Board, glo Global Core Team, Global Research Team, and Global Education Team. We have a very long time horizon for our work. We think of our dignity community as a seed for a future dignity family to flourish globally also in the far future. Can we imagine a world without borders and without military forces, only with rule of law institutions that keep individual dominators from undermining the global commons? Can we imagine a world shared global commons of global unity in diversity collectively protected and replenished? Can we imagine globally inclusive cooperation rather than a cooperation only sought for the sake of ever more effective domination over enemies? Could we make such a wor world work? The resounding answer is yes. Thus is the state of the world today. Few people take in that our species, Homo sapiens, lives, lives in a historical moment that is unparalleled, not just in terms of crisis, but also of opportunity. For the, for the first time in our history, we, humankind, are in a position to succeed in bringing about the adaptations that are long overdue, basically since millennia, and our poor forebears couldn't bring about. They couldn't. We are in this position now. Our ancestors could not see pictures of our blue marble from the perspective of an astronaut. For the first time in our history, we as humankind can fully appreciate our place in the commons. Unlike our forebears, we have the privilege of experiencing the overview effect with respect to our planet. We see it from outside. We can see it from outside and the effect that this is an effect that helps us understand that we humans are one species living on one tiny planet. We can embrace biophilia. We can feel the ecology of the living taking place within one circumscribed biopoetic space that is shared between all being, living beings. We have access to a much more comprehensive knowledge base through the, about the universe and our place in it than our grandparents ever had. Finally, we have the very good news that from research that human nature is neither good nor evil, but social. And that much of human action depends on the ways constitutive rules frame relational contexts. In other words, cooperation and solidarity in the world 
can be nurtured systemically through building appropriate societal frames. I therefore suggest we sit together globally and find out, and many people do that already, and find out whether the existing regulatory rules can be sufficiently tweaked or not. If not, then we need to create new constitutive rules of engagement for our modern world system. In times of crisis, as in ours, the choice between pessimism and optimism is not an option. Pessimism is a luxury one can only afford in easy times. Dignifying efforts cannot depend on any calculation of whether making an effort is worth it or not. Future is not like a business partner to make deals with. We simply have to make the effort no matter what. Furthermore, what do we mean by hope? If we stand in front of deadly crises, like now, a potentially hopeless situation, and we meekly hope for miracles to happen so we, do, so we do not have to act, if hope means waiting for miracles from heaven or from other people, there will be no hope. Likewise, if we wait for hope to somehow befall us and motivate us to act, there will be no hope. Hope depends on our action, on our courage to create hope against hope, to imagine new ways of arranging our affairs on this planet. We are the authors of hope, not its recipients. Hope is the outcome, not the beginning. Only if we give it our all straight away, without hesitation, there will be hope. Wringing our hands just slows us down from pushing up our sleeves. People in a lifeboat drown if they lose time on waiting for hope. Again, what do we mean by hope? The strong might hope to survive by throwing the weak overboard. A human Titanic might go down and those on the luxury top floor might hope to survive by monopolizing the lifeboats and letting the rest perish. Is that what we mean by hope? Rather than losing time and energy on calculating odds and waiting for hope, let us give our all to make sure that even if we go down, we go down together in love and dignity. We cannot know the future. We are surrounded by symptoms, symptoms and predictions, and we will know which symptoms are significant and which prophecies are true only after what has been predicted has happened. Post res perditas. The outcome is in our hands. If we wait that others should save us, if we engage in apathy or selfish carelessness, there will be undignified survival for a few at best, together with undignified demise for the rest. If we give it our all, if we embrace appropriate levels of fear and invest this fear into hope against hope, then we will succeed with the dignified survival of all together, or if unavoidable, at least we will go down in dignity together. Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the most important authors of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. After the atrocities of the Second World War, the goal was never again. And this is also my life mission. When Rachel Carson published her book Silent Spring in 1962, many were full of hope for a substantial turnaround. Earth, Earth Rise was the high spirit of the 1960s. It transmuted into profit versus planet around 1970 to 1987. Then environmentalism turned into sustainability around 1987 to 1997 and finally into market environmentalism from 1998 to 2018. In 2019 came Greta Thunberg. In 2020, we have the COVID-19 virus. What comes next? As I hail from a displaced family who has been deeply affected by the two world wars of the last century, I'm particularly aware of the vulnerability vulnerabilities of our human arrangements on this planet. 
all my life, I have been preparing for the next Eleanor Roosevelt moment, like in 1948, waiting for a new window of opportunity to open for dignity to regain the attention it deserves. Together with Linda Hartling and other close collaborators, I'm helping to nurture a moment like this through our dignity work to come, ready to be among its co-authors if needed, ready to contribute with our approach to loving dignity. Circa three, if you look at this overview over important dates, circa three, 100,000 years ago, roughly, our forebears enjoyed a win-win situation of seemingly infinite abundance. 12,000 years ago, this changed, roughly, changed into a win-lose situation. Our ancestors adapted with developing strategies of competition for domination with the security dilemma as outcome. 1757 is a forerunner in linguistics and I'm writing a book about this just now, a forerunner of 1948, we see egalization and the emergence of dignity humiliation. 1967, 72, we can for the first time see our planet from outside, a foundational shift in perspective. 1980, we start to overuse our resources. 1991 marks the end of the Cold War and an opportunity to unite in one world. We missed this opportunity. 2007 and 8, we see the collapse of the blind belief in the wisdom of the market. Now, the generation alive now carries more responsibility than any other generation before. The responsibility to co-create new ways of arranging our affairs on planet Earth without systemic humiliation, to co-create the next form of civilization, to learn how to cooperate with our own evolution, how to manifest what Gandhi called Satyagraha. The Sustainable Development Goals set by the United Nations General Assembly for 2030 are a worthy start, yet, only if goal eight is seriously reconfigured, I fear. It shows, this, this goal eight shows, look at it, an exponential economic growth curve, a curve that represents an impossibility in a finite context. Goal eight has the potential to undermine all other goals as it, and this, these are the words, words of a scholar of human needs, Ian Goff, it lumps together important need-related goals, participation in work and acceptable conditions in work, for example, with economic growth, a questionable means to achieving these goals. The outgoing UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Philip Elston, adds the UN Sustainable development goals are clearly not going to be met without drastic recalibration. This framework places immense and mistaken faith in growth and the private sector. This is also my conclusion from my global experience. I'm waiting for Eleanor Roosevelt, a new Eleanor Roosevelt moment. So therefore, for me, dignity is a mandate, the duty to transform the world. I have coined the term dignism, dignity ism. To go away, to leave behind these hot button words, capitalism, communism, socialism, very hot button words, cycles of humiliation are driven by them. My aim is to point at the positive goals of co globe egalization. This is how I describe dignism. Dignism describes a world where every newborn finds space and is nurtured to unfold their highest and best, embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. It is a world where the caring capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everyone's basic needs are met. 
It is a world where we unite, unite in respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity, where we prevent unity from devolving into oppressive uniformity and keep diversity from, sli from sliding into hostile division. When I look back, then I went to the library for the first time around 1996, expecting to find lots of literature on humiliation. And more than 20 years of research are now behind me. Let me now end and with briefly summarizing the conclusion that congelled for me for 2021, for, two, for 2020 and the future. If we, as humanity, wish to heal ecocide and sociocide and survive in dignity, we need a strong cogitosphere, a strong realm of thinking. Therefore, the first step is to overcome cogitoside or cogitoside, the destruction of our thinking. We, as humanity, need to face the fact that we stand at the edge of a so-called Seneca cliff, the kind of rapid collapse that is characteristic of complex systems when they disintegrate. We have to face this fact without panic and without denial. Our scientists inform us that we have a window of opportunity of around 10 years to step back from the edge. In this situation, we can no longer accept negative peace kept in place by systemic cogitocide and systematic cogitocide, cogitocide, peace kept in place by military means, by the traditional male role script of unidimensional and unilateral strategies of competition for domination and control, strategies of fighting the enemy and conquering the unknown. This, this is a kind of peace that hastens global ecocide through global sociocide as in, it maintains the security dilemma. You remember, if you want peace, prepare for war. And it puts fire into the growth dilemma if you want material riches invest in exploitation. And it stokes cycles of humiliation. In the interconnected world of today, seeking, seeking peace through armament amounts to sociocide at a global scale the killing of the cohesion in the global community. In today's interconnected world, discrediting the opportunity of citizens to citizens trust building represents cogitocide at a global scale. It means stoking the security dilemma needlessly while doors stand open to transcend it by building lasting global peace. Feelings of humiliation are the nuclear bomb of the emotions in an interconnected world in which the promise of human rights ideals is salient and cycles of humiliation will therefore turn the global village into a war zone if we are not doing something. The call, call therefore must be, let us celebrate respect for equal dignity for all as responsible individuals free to engage in loving mutual solidarity. Let us celebrate diversity through unity in equality and dignity without humiliation on this small and finite planet that, that is our common home. As the world watches the heartbreaking coronavirus pandemic unfold while I speak. Our hope is for an exponential change of heart so that global unity rooted in respect for local diversity becomes possible. The central question we face as humanity, which we must ask and answer together in all languages, not just the four here, remains. How must we, humankind, arrange our affairs on this planet so that dignified life will be possible in the long term. Wie können wir, die Menschheit, unsere Angelegenheiten auf diesem Planeten so gestalten, dass ein würdiges Leben langfristig möglich ist? Wurden wir wie Männer gehetten, ordne, wo es sagt, wo den Planeten, slik at verdi liv, 
les mulets pour lang sicht. Comment devons nous l'humanité organiser nos affaires sur cette planète pour qu'une vie digne soit possible à long terme? Thank you. Vielen Dank. Merci. Tusniatletak.